Now let's see how you did. This one here is fairly easy. Most of you probably got it right. This is the opening temperature of the thermostat. In other words, that's the term. That is the temperature when the thermostat begins to open. Wax element begins to pull against that spring. And a lot of the times I had noticed that for some strange reason, even though the thermostat looked mechanically okay, I don't know if it was because the spring was getting weak or whatever, some of them would open too early. And they would be opening at like 150 degrees or something, and that would throw you a code. Joe puts his car in neutral while coasting down a mile long hill in Arizona. That causes the vehicle to burn more gas than if he left it in gear. If you're coasting, just about anybody that has studied fuel injection will tell you that the fuel injectors are turned off when the vehicle is coasting. So if you're coasting down a long hill and you've got engine braking going on, the old algorithm Ford used to write was that a calculated pulse width if, if it's a calculated pulse width less than 1.2 milliseconds and an engine speed greater than 1200 RPM, the injectors are turned off. Alright, question three. Spark plug suddenly fails and stops firing while the engine's a highway cruise. You ever seen a spark plug bridge like that? I've seen it happen on a dadgum lawnmower. This lady next door had her, lawn, her, her mower wouldn't start and she said, can you come and look at my mower? And so I, I initially, the first time it wouldn't start, I went over there and pulled the cord and, you know, and then I checked for spark and it had spark and all that. And so I got a, a, a piece of paper towel and soaked it in gasoline and put it in the carburetor. And it, start, and it started and ran on the gasoline it was drawing out of that piece of paper towel. And so she basically had some O-rings that were deteriorating in the carburetor and I ordered a little $30 carburetor for it popped that on there and it started on the first pull. The next time she went to use it, it she pulled a cord and it wouldn't start, but the gas wasn't the problem that time. It had spark, but when I pulled the spark plug out, it had a little thing bridging it right here. It's amazing. It's, sometimes it'll be just a little thread sized little thing, but it seemed like it would blow it out of there, but because of the pressure like this, I don't know, for some reason it won't blow it out and it stays there and that plug won't fire. Anyway, this would cause a lean exhaust because of the oxygen content because the oxygen sensor, remember, is not smelling fuel, it's smelling oxygen. Alright, the header pipes developed a crack leak. Now this is the thing about lambda. When the O2 readings are balanced, the lambda ratio will read zero. If the mixture contains too much oxygen, a lean mixture, the, ram, the, the lambda will read greater than 1.0. So if you see a, a lambda above 1.0, it basically means it's seeing too much oxygen in the exhaust. If it, you know, and back in the 75, whenever the first oxygen sensor was installed on a Saab, that's what they called it, was a lambda sensor. If a mixture contains too little O2, which is a rich mixture, lambda will be less than 1.0. So you've got a rich mixture when you're seeing a lambda that goes below 1.0. So anyway, it would drive lambda, reading, lambda readings high on that, so if it's got an O2. So you're basically going to see, you know, if there's too much oxygen in there, you're going to see it being greater. And it's basically going to try to correct that by driving the fuel trim the opposite direction. An EGR valve suddenly sticks partially open when commanded closed. That's going to make the O2 show a little bit of a rich, mix, rich mixture because that exhaust gas is replacing oxygen. And whenever it replaces oxygen, General Motors for years used the oxygen sensor as a kind of a feedback rationale, in other words, rationality feedback, so it could tell when the EGR was actually flowing. It would look for the oxygen sensor to show a little bit rich, because that's one of the things that happens when you've got oxygen EGR flowing. A lean air fuel mixture burns how? Cold and fast, hot and fast, hot and slow, or cold and slow. It basically burns hot and fast. The titanium oxygen sensors they used to put on the uh, 87 to 90 model Jeep Cherokees were basically measuring the temperature of the exhaust stream to determine if it was rich or lean. And they fed 5 volts down there and it had to do with the way the resistance of the sensor changed with the heat. But on those screwball sensors, they read 5 volts, like on the 4 liter, they read 5 volts lean and 0 volts rich, which was the opposite of what we were used to and a whole lot different voltage. But hot and fast is how a lean air fuel mixture burns. 
an engine has an IEC reading of 2% at idle, that means the engine may have a vacuum leak. Depending, if the vacuum leak is close to one of the cylinders, it'll skip on that cylinder, but it's a, if it's a vacuum leak that's common to the entire plenum, it's going to cause, it's kind of like idle air control does whenever it opens up and it lets air go around the throttle plate. If air is bypassing the throttle plate, the engine will run faster. It'll, the idle air control the, you know, will actually step down to a really low reading. And so that's basically going to mean you're looking for a vacuum leak. Or if the idle is too high for some other reason, like if somebody has done something to turn a screw and they work that uh, throttle body up into the point where the, there's enough air going past it that the uh, RPM target is being met without the R engine controller having to do anything with the IEC. That's called, Ford used to call that the dead band, where it wasn't using IEC. Engine load increases, what happens? Manifold pressure increases. Both manifold vacuum and manifold pressure are like two sides of one number. The engine has a good strong fuel pressure, good strong spark, clean spark plugs, and a good compression won't start. The engine will start with any two spark plugs removed. And it sounds like a machine gun, but it will start. That's clogged exhaust. I had learned that a long time ago, and I helped a guy that was working next to me with that. Rounded off exhaust cam load will cause induction backfire, as peculiar as that sounds, because think about it, the exhaust has nowhere to go. Whenever it's time for it to leave, it's got nowhere to go because the exhaust valves either not opening very much or not opening at all, and so all that pressure has got to go somewhere, so it goes back into the intake. Some of your old mobiles used to break rocker arms. And I used to wonder why it was that when it broke an exhaust rocker arm, it would backfire through the intake because after all, this was an exhaust rocker arm, but that's because that pressure was looking for somewhere to go, and the next time the intake valve opens, it would pop back into the intake. Also cause some you know, induction backfire because of the fuel that was resting, you know, passing through there. Enhanced live data shows the IAT sensor reading is 101, and ECT go see the enhanced data will substitute a figure that it thinks will work. So if you look at all of your temperature sensors and one of them is an odd man out, like if you look at transmission oil temperature, engine coolant temperature, intake air temperature, one of them's reading a lot higher than the other ones on enhanced data, then you're basically looking at what's going to be minus 40 if you're looking at OBD2 generic data because it will not lie to you about that. It'll show minus 40 if you unplug the sensor or if the wire's cut or if the sensor's open. All right, part store pulled one PO 128 and 172. This is fairly simple. What happened was this thing was running rich for a while and it had enough blow by of fuel into the crankcase that it slowly contaminated the crankcase with engine. I've actually seen this myself. And it slowly uh, crank, uh, contaminated the crankcase all with fuel and it was pulling that through the PCV system. The fuel trims kept dialing back, balancing the air fuel mix until it got it way out of line. And so whenever you change the oil, all that fuel that it expected wasn't there anymore and it was like having a carburetor. It was really badly out of adjustment. Now I will tell you this is usually more noticeable on an older car than it is a newer one. But I have actually seen that on my mother's car when the thermostat was, you know, need to be replaced and it had been running too cold for too long. Dad replaced the thermostat. It still ran good until about a week later he changed the oil and it went idle. So all he had to do, I told him to clean the throttle body with the air, uh, with the battery terminals off and put them back on and it would idle just fine. You might have also noticed that adaptive learning, like on a Dodge pickup I used to see, somebody would replace the battery. And when in replacing a battery, they lose their adaptive idle learning, and it wouldn't idle. Well, they could either drive it around until it learned to idle again, or they could go ahead and just pull battery terminals back off and wash the throttle body out. So anyway, that's adaptive idle learning is something we don't often think about much, but it's real. Um, doing a roadside assistance in Panama City, if the barrow is reading like you're at 4,000 feet or something, and you're at sea level, which would be Panama City, Florida, that's one of your clues, you're going to see long fuel trim that's having to add because it sees this high altitude reading. It puts less fuel in there because it thinks there's less air pressure. When it does that, 
the O2 sensor picks up on the fact that there's too much air in there and it keeps adding fuel until it can balance it out. I've seen this too. Typically you're more likely to see this on one with a, man with a MAP sensor measuring barometric pressure than with a mass airflow, but anything's possible. I've also seen mass airflow volts reading 0.79 and uh, you know with a good sensor and I've actually thought a bad sensor on that one reading 0.81 if you're reading voltage, you know, some of them read frequency and this kind of thing. But these were the ones that I used to fool with on the Fords. Uh, I might not have given you enough information there, but if you knew what inches of mercury should be in Panama City, Florida, you could have figured that one out. Pontiac, the 3.4, I've seen this one too. This guy said this thing uh, idles rough when it's really, you know, when you first started, it just idles terrible. And so when I went over there and we cranked it up, it had been sitting there for several hours, and when we cranked it up, within uh, about a minute, that manifold was so hot you couldn't put your hand on it. And the only thing that's going to make it that hot, typically, is EGR. Exhaust gas flowing through there when they just started. EGR flow at idle. This right here is valve stem seal deposits. Uh, that used to be a thing on Chevys and Fords and some of the other vehicles, whenever they're leaking through there, every time that oil burns off it leaves a little crust and it continues to build, it can completely clog that up. But this will cause a surge that feels almost like an EGR surge, and when you unplug the vacuum going to the EGR it may smooth out, and it'll fool you into thinking you got an EGR problem of some kind. But this thing right here, uh, these deposits are going to make that spark not as well as it should be. I've also seen that caused by, you know, not this kind of deposit, but those rusty red deposits caused by octane booster that would produce similar symptoms. Looking at the plugs will tell you a tale though. If you see that, that doesn't mean you need to break the engine down and put valve stem cells in it right away unless it smokes it idle or it puts out a heck of a lot of smoke when you first start it up in the parking lot. All right, using the barometer, the readings below calculate the barometric pressure. If you add manifold absolute pressure and manifold vacuum together, you're going to get 29.6, and that's what your barometer ought to be reading. Based on this live data, the catalytic converter is not storing oxygen. Notice how both of these, 1-1 one, one, and 1-2, one, are mirroring one another. That's not supposed to happen. Uh, and it, that's basically what was going on with this one here. Snap compression test, that's going to be a worn intake valve cam load because whenever you snap it, it can't get enough air. And when it can't get enough air, it's going to have lower compression during the snap. When the engine's running slower, you know it's a little bit lower here, but when the engine's running slower, it has a little more time for the air to go in there. This is the thing about volumetric efficiency. That air has got to round a lot of corners and go through to find its way into the engine. And if it's a naturally aspirated engine, meaning it's not turbocharged or supercharged, then if there's anything that's keeping it from getting all the air it should in that one cylinder, which would be valve spring issues or a worn cam lobe or you know, something like that, uh, it will cause it to have a low reading under snap acceleration. You may see some of these questions like this on the L1 test. Uh, I have actually known of people running into trouble on the L1 test uh, because they hadn't actually studied this when they went and took L1. Uh, this one right here is a screwball. Uh, this character came to teach a class one time when I was first started teaching in college. And he says, do you have any trainer cars here? And I said, oh, well, I got the only one I had when I first went to the college in 2001 that would run was an 87 Honda Accord. Now, this guy had never seen this car before. I mean, he actually, and he had a snap-on counselor with him, which is what that scope is, I think they call it. And so he, he got a, uh, when I pulled it in there, he looked at it, and he saw some white smoke coming out the back, and, and he says, uh, hmm, okay, and he looked at this vacuum waveform, and he says, I want to check compression. And so we got the plugs out of it, and then we checked the compression, and it was high. It was really high. It was like 275 PSI. And so I says, uh, what the heck does this mean? And he said, that is going to be a cam that is one tooth advanced, the camshaft one tooth advanced. We didn't have time to investigate that at the moment. But anyway, we just put the plugs back in and all that. The next day, I had my students check the timing mark. I mean, line the timing marks up on this thing. They lined up the 
cam mark and the crank mark and all that. And that thing was one tooth advanced just like he said it was. Now this guy had no prior knowledge of that vehicle. That was pretty dead gum impressive. Well, what, why would one tooth advanced cause it to do that? Well, if it's one tooth advanced, think about that for a minute. The intake valve is opening early, but it's closing early as well while the piston is still going down. If it closes early while the piston is on the intake stroke, it will pull all past the rings into the cylinder. So that's going to cause the smoke. It's also going to cause extra oil in the cylinder that's going to raise the compression as if you were doing a wet test all the time. And so that basically was a very interesting learning experience for me to see this guy look at this vacuum waveform, have us check the compression, saw the white smoke coming out of the pipe, and he, had, he pinpointed that it was one or two teeth. The camshaft was running ahead of the crankshaft, and somebody had fooled around with a timing belt on it because it was a trainer car, and that was exactly what was going on. So that was pretty impressive. Study this waveform carefully and think. Now this is not hard to figure out. It's got six. You know, if you look at the tall one, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Excuse me. Let's start over here. I screwed up over there because of that first one. One, two, three, four, five, six. See, it's got six cylinders. That's number four, right there where that coil pulse is. Firing order on a lot of these V6s, not all of them, but on a lot of them, one, two, three, four, five, six. On the Ford V6s is 142536. All right. But anyway, when you can tell, it looks to me like if you're going to go by that one high uh, compression, you know, the, it takes more effort to squeeze the air on that one so there's more amps than all of these other ones have got less compression than they should have. And that's typically going to be an out of time situation. Now, question number 21. How many degrees of crankshaft rotation between A and A? There's going to be 720 degrees right here because it takes two full crankshaft rotations to complete a cycle. All right. Identify the part of the waveform corresponding to the valve overlap. That's going to be right here. And the exhaust valve is open here. The intake valve opens here right before the exhaust valve closed. And that's a little bit turbulence you see there. But the D area is going to be your valve overlap area. The valve is open at position C. That's the exhaust valve is open. This is actually atmospheric pressure. And so whenever the, uh, whenever you, these ought to actually be even with one another too. If one of them is really low, it's got a deep pocket, and this one here is slightly higher, you know, then you can use that to determine uh, some valve time issues and all that. Identify the part of the waveform where the intake valve is open. It's basically this place right here. And it closes right along here, and then it starts compressing the air it drew in at this point. How many degrees of camshaft rotation between A and A? That's 360 degrees. So between A and A, you've got one turn of the camshaft. All right. 